This week on the WriterCon podcast. Tough never quits. Welcome to WriterCon, a gathering place for writers to share their knowledge about writing and the writing world. Your hosts are William Bernhardt, best-selling novelist and author of the Red Sneaker Books on Writing, and Laura Bernhardt, award-winning author of the Wantland Files book series. Thank you, Jesse Ulrich, and hello, writers. Or should it be more like, hey there, writers? I'm never sure about the energy level I should be bringing to this opening. I mean, should I be shouting because I'm excited and enthusiastic? Uh, now I look at myself and I look like the Joker or something. Uh, or should I be more chill? Because, you know, I'm a, a, I'm a writer and writers are cool. It's just finding the right tone. I don't know, Laura, what do you think? I think whatever you do, you nail it. Oh. And now you know why I married her. But <laughs> clearly I should have gone to Jesse first. Jesse, what do you think? L- I, listen, podcasts are a, a, like an intimate sharing sort of situation. Uh-huh. So you should you should have the energy of like a fireside chat, uh, uh, like a, a nice cushy booth hello, at a writer. fancy restaurant. That's the tone. Oh, I like uh, that. Yeah. Do that one. Did you like that one? Good. <laughs> yes. Well, as we record this, we've recently experienced presidential debates And the only thing I learned is that apparently energy is everything. So I wanted to bring lots of energy, but maybe I wanted to bring energy this morning to the pickleball court too, but that didn't work out so well. I needed more coffee. (laughs) I came along, you know, we woke up as we started exercising. All right, now I'm going to practice my cool voice. Mm. Our interview today is with Raymond Paul Johnson, who is a prominent trial attorney of many years, who has now turned his hand to writing. It's a legal thriller, and it's a page-turner. It's called Conspiracy Ignited. We'll be talking to him about that and much more. But first, the news. First big news story, Barnes & Noble has purchased the Tattered Cover Bookstore, uh, the chain, the original and the satellite bookstores. Many of you will know what I'm talking about when I mention Tattered Cover. We live in Oklahoma and they're in Colorado, but it's close enough. They have been one of the best known, if not the best known, indie bookstore for decades. In fact, trivia moment, Laura, my very first ever out of town, like on the road book tour book signing for Perfect Justice, my first hardcover. This is like 94 or something. I'm dating myself. But anyway, it was at the Tattered Cover Bookstore in Denver. And because it was January, there was, of course, a huge snowstorm. Oh, no. So I didn't even want to go. <laughs> but my oh. escort showed up. And I mean, it's a blizzard. I was like, can, can we really make it? And she said, oh, yeah, we do this all the time. We'll be. So I got to the bookstore. Exactly one person showed up <laughs> in this blizzard. And she only came because I knew her in college. And so Aww. she showed up to say, but she did buy a book. And they taught me how to autograph books properly. And we had a fun night of not really the best snowstorm. But that wasn't really the news aspect of bringing up tattered cover. The problem is that this long and revered bookstore has had a tough, tough couple of years. When I was there way back then, Joyce Meskus, who was the original owner and did it for many, many years, was still there. But in 2020, she sold it to new owners. And that's why you read about Tattered Cover becoming the largest Black-owned bookstore in, U- in the United States, which then led to controversy because they decided to, quote, remain neutral, end quote, on Black Lives Matter, and then he, last year they filed for bankruptcy. Well, now they've been purchased by Barnes & Noble, and who five years ago would have thought Barnes & Noble would be buying anything? Oh, that says anything. something yeah. right in and of itself. The store and satellites will continue to operate under the tattered cover name, and Barnes & Noble anticipates it'll run pretty much as it did before. This actually makes a little bit more sense than it might seem at first because 
as people who follow this podcast already know, Barnes & Noble is now led by James Daunt, a fellow that the owners brought over from England, where he saved the Waterstone book chain, bookstore chain. And part of what he did there was actually buying multiple ind independent bookstores and running them under the same names, but you know, transforming them from risky, money-losing businesses to flourishing ones. Anyway, Laura, what's your take on this? Is this good news or bad? I never like to see a bookstore go out of business. Mm -hmm. So I'm pleased that they picked it up and it can continue to operate as it did, especially since you have that little tie to it. I'm happy to see that opportunity for a brick and mortar store to to remain open, both for authors and for readers. People mm -hmm. can just get, and I like hearing that it's just gonna be kind of business as usual. They're just gonna keep moving forward with it. It apparently is a business model that's worked mm -hmm. before. I hope it can keep working here. Well, part of what Barnes & Noble has been doing, I mean, since Donk took over, has in part been letting individual bookstores have more control about what's which uh, about what they're going to put up front to appeal to their local readers and that's what tattered cover has been doing all along i don't know jesse what do you think you're in tulsa there's already two barnes and nobles plus a books a million um would you shop at this <laughs> tattered cover which is secretly a barnes and noble yeah i mean i here's the thing i don't care necessarily who owns a company that already has its own branding if they if they're buying that thing, if they're buying the thing and leaving it be, then I'm mm -hmm. I'm fine with it. Again, like it's one of those things where, like better than bankruptcy. Right? Yeah, like yes. where, where we had we had we had too many bookstores to be able to stay sort of economically viable, and now like they got rid of too many of them, and now it's like we actually need a couple more bookstores. So instead of like buying new land, having to construct new. Uh, you know, new stores. You buy yeah. a company that already exists and just let them just run it better, probably. Uh, right. From Hopefully, a, a background standpoint, just leave, leave it be. I think it's great. It does make sense. It's already a bookstore, right? Yeah, it's already a bookstore. Okay, new yeah. story number two. This is about authors' equity. They've announced their first ten titles. Again, listeners of the podcast will remember when we announced the formation of authors' equity, which is. Bottom line, a small group of veterans of the traditional New York publishing industry coming together to form their own publishing company. And now they've announced what their first titles are going to be. And many are being written by known quantities, you know, pre previously published to New York authors. James Frey, controversial, probably the best known one. And Here's something that I also found interesting. Not only does it announce the new titles and authors, but, but announces what editor has mm -hmm. been assigned to each of them, which doesn't normally happen. Uh, yeah. Some of them are interesting. I, I don't know. Maybe I'm being rude. I don't think any of them sound breathtakingly exciting. Like I didn't read the bio and think oh, that's going to hit number one. I did think the list was very New York and um, in both names and topics. So, Jesse, are these people really doing anything innovative or are they j just going to make the big five the big six? I mean, I guess it's how you view, like, how they chose which books to do mm -hmm. and, you know, are they doing it different than the big five or are they just doing it the same and calling themselves something different. So I guess we'll have to wait and see. Yeah. Um, but well, they're doing less, you know, if they've got 10 books uh, for the next season, even, but it's probably mm -hmm. more like the next half year or so, then that's way less books than you're going to see coming out of yeah. Penguin Random House. So maybe that'll give them a chance to focus more. I'm not sure that necessarily means they're going to sell better. Yeah. I don't know. Laura, I heard you respond when I mentioned that uh, the editorial assignments were being announced. What do you think about that? That's so different. And I'm sitting here thinking that I feel like, do we think they're doing that to add that level of credibility, saying, look, we've got editors devoted to these projects, good editors? I think from the editor's standpoint, it puts a little bit of um, stress on you, the pressure to do a really good job. 
On the flip side of that, I've edited some books where they go on to win awards or I see them mm -hmm. perform really well. And I think, oh, I wish everyone knew that I was involved with that book. Yeah, and yeah. I, I helped craft it into the book that it is today that is getting great reviews and winning awards and doing well. So um, mm -hmm. I have some yeah. mixed feelings. I think having that announced up front, I would then feel pressure. I would worry that I, I wasn't living up to the challenge, but on the back end of it, when it does well, it would be kind of nice to have that yeah. recognition. It did make me wonder why we don't include that, like on the maybe yeah. the Bursa page where we put all the copyright yeah. info. You know, next week we're interviewing a guy who writes for comic books, among other things. Comic books always identify the editor of the story. And of course, if you've been through to a movie and sat through the roughly eight minutes of credits, <laughs> they, yep. they identify everybody. Yep. So, uh, you know, I think this is not a bad idea actually. Uh, and mighty, even for smaller publishers, it, you know, mm -hmm. I'd lend credibility to the work if we saw, yes, they did, in fact, have they an, had editor. an editor. And yep. is, an editor. maybe editors would be more careful. I don't know if they knew their name was going to be on it. Um, but, it's an interesting choice. I'm excited to see where it goes. Yeah, me too. All right, Jesse, let's hear that interview music and talk to uh, Raymond Paul Johnson. Raymond Paul Johnson, welcome to the podcast. Well, thank you, Bill. Thank you. All right, traditional, and you're coming to us live from ALA, right? That's that. I really appreciate you taking time out from the fun to <laughs> do a yeah, podcast I, interview. Uh, it's quite an experience. Anyone who hasn't should come because uh, you get thousands and thousands of book lovers running around the same yeah. video. That center. sounds it's, amazing. Uh, exactly. It's something. I have, but yeah. not in a while. Okay, traditional first question. If you could offer writers one piece of advice, what would it be? Um, I, I think it would probably be one of the sub-themes of my book, Conspiracy Ignited. Mm -hmm. And uh, in a few words, uh, the two main characters, whenever they get into trouble, remind themselves of their saying that they developed over the years of friendship. And that's Tough never quits. Mm. And mm. tough That's never quits. Yeah. yeah. And uh, for writing, yeah, especially because uh, none of us just sit and, well, I shouldn't say none. Maybe James Lee Burke does, but, or Nelson DeMille, but most of us do not mm. sit and always have the love flowing. You know, uh, you get some tough points and you got to go, I go take some coffee and I come back and do it again. Yeah, that sounds um, good. Well, tell us more about your book, Conspiracy Ignited. What's it about? Well, it's a, a legal thriller, although pre-release reviews have called it an action-adventure thriller. Uh, actually, someone said it was a political thriller, which I never thought of it as such. But what it's about is a, a lawyer who happens to be a pilot, and he has a practice. And what's different about this lawyer than most lawyers and most legal thrillers is uh, he does civil litigation. He's what they call a trial attorney, a trial right. lawyer. Um, you know, in most books, they're either criminal lawyers or corporate lawyers uh, and running around like the firm, you know, <laughs> where they run. Uh, but th this is a civil litigator. And uh, I think what I would say is different about this book. I wanted them to be very real. Mm -hmm. So I really wanted to introduce people to the life of a civil trial attorney in mm -hmm. uh, in America, because I didn't think there's much written about it, mm -hmm. uh, not in the way of fiction. Mm -hmm. So yeah, and uh, he's going about his cases. He flies uh, all up and down the West Coast to do depositions and things, mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden, all hell breaks loose. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, in, in fact, all of a sudden, the first first sentence, first paragraph of the book, all hell breaks loose. Uh, and he doesn't know it, but there's a secret society that's trying to take over the third wing of our government, trying to take over mm -hmm. judges and justices. Uh, 
and control the courtrooms. The idea being that if you can control the courtrooms, you can first, you can make a lot of money. Secondly, uh, you get real control, like we see in the headlines today with uh, decisions that are made at all levels mm -hmm. of, the, of the judiciary. Yeah. So, so I'm going to uh, have to ask what everybody else is thinking. Does this relate to current contemporary real world events in any way? Yes, but not immediate. Okay. We've got to remember, I'm traditionally published. So uh, this book out for was actually in final uh, two years ago. It took two mm -hmm. years from final to, to get uh, to it. And uh, by the way, my publishers, uh, I got to show this because uh, this is the cover. Can you see that? Yep. That, that was done by my uh, publisher, the cover design person. And the minute I saw it, I said, you've got it. We don't have to. Oh, uh, I sometimes I have to go through 25 of these. I said, not That's this the time. best <laughs> feeling when you just open it up and you're like, ah, they got it. Bam. You That's know, funny. and uh, so, yeah. And, and the why the reason it's so perfect is because, again, it's the Raven Society. They're mm. a cabal, basically a terrorist cabal, uh, actually part paramilitary, too. And uh, she's got the courthouse. And then she's got this ravens coming down. Mm -hmm. And of course, the big secret in the book, I'll tell everybody now, is a oh. group of ravens is called a conspiracy. Uh, 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 a group of ravens is called wonderful. a conspiracy. So yeah, so it all came together <laughs> really nicely. Yeah. Nice. Very interesting. Yeah. So you did so you did uh, weave in, I guess, some current events. But I'm also oh. hearing you talk about your your yeah. protagonist being a pilot and lawyer. Oh so how did your time as a combat pilot and an attorney um, influence your writing? Did you did you use a lot, or did you just kind of weave in some experiences? How how did that come about? Well. Uh, to answer the question directly, uh, we lawyers should do that. You know, we should answer the question directly. Um, or our, our witnesses it, should. It, yeah. it, well, <laughs> that's true. That's true. But I mean, you know, you teach by example. I, right. <laughs> no, uh, it, almost every scene in the book, every scene, uh, certainly every major scene, is based on a composite of things I either experienced or witnessed in my life. And uh, for instance, I spent six months with the CIA in a combat situation, and this pilot, his name is Eric Rich, by the way, that's the name of the lawyer protagonist, and he also spent that time, and so when he gets in real trouble in the book, he calls on his friends at the CIA, um, and that helps for a while, but, you know, they... Good times don't flow forever, and uh, yeah. poor Eric does have some problems, <laughs> mm -hmm. including the CIA bail on him. So uh, th then he's mm -hmm. left alone with his. Well, he has a small law firm uh, and some good friends, and mm -hmm. and they basically are left alone against this uh, secret society that mm -hmm. that they only know about, and they can't tell other people for reasons I can't say right now. Cool. But uh, yeah. Now, you've been a trial lawyer for like 35 years or more. I should warn you up front, I am a lawyer as well, although I haven't practiced in about 35 years. Uh, <laughs> and, <laughs> and I also have written legal thrillers. This book has a lot to say about the legal system, some of it uh, pretty dark. Can you talk more about that? Yeah, I, again, I, I wanted to be real. <laughs> writing this book, I wanted it to be real because so many legal thrillers I think are not. Uh, and so um, I, I really want to do the good, the bad, and the ugly of uh, civil litigation and judges and and even the jury system. Uh, and throughout the book, I speak to that through the characters, of course. Uh, and uh, yeah, I mean, uh, an example being uh, mm -hmm. once in a while you run into a judge that just has her or his mind made up. And uh, it doesn't it, matter what you say. Oh my God. For, from a trial attorney's point of view, it really was the only thing that angered me in, in more than, I've been practicing now more than 35 years in trial courts all over the country. And uh, it's just when you run into a judge like that, it's like you might as well just, you know, tell your client, we got to go on appeal. We'll be on right. appeal. We'll win it next that, time. 
and that takes two or three years sometimes. Yeah. So uh, it's not good news. But yeah, but you know, on the other hand, what I try to point out in the book is there are some judges that are just sent from God. I mean, they you know they don't have their mind made up. They take everything based on the evidence and facts, and they make really really good decisions. And sure. that's like being in heaven when that happens to you. Do you have trouble juggling both careers? Because you're still practicing law, right? And now writing and probably working on another book after this one. So how do you handle that? Okay, uh, that's that's kind of interesting. Uh, I tried to write this novel while I was practicing. And I think you know what that means. That means <laughs> I'm writing this thing on at airports, Mm -hmm. on, on airplanes as I'm going to depositions in different states, uh, in hotel rooms, uh, in between other things. Mm -hmm. And so all I had at the end of a year and a half of doing that was fragments, pieces. Uh, I didn't have to ask anybody. I knew it's going nowhere. <laughs> and uh, so along came COVID, and COVID uh, was an opportunity. So I cranked back on my practice. Uh, boy, did I ever crank back on it. Uh, to the point where today I really, uh, because I am writing full time now, uh, I, I teach at the University of Southern California. I teach, okay. uh, yeah, I teach law, product liability, aviation law, and aviation mm -hmm. safety. Uh, and then I consult on cases around the nation because that doesn't take everything out of me. I want to put everything in in the writing. Mm -hmm. So and, you're juggling uh, several careers, really. Yeah, but I've done that all my life. I, uh, you know, do I get bored easy? No, I tell people I have trouble keeping a job. That's the problem. <laughs> I keep switching. Focus uh, issues. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, you just got to roll with it. But uh, I enjoy that. I enjoy having, you know, various things that I can just focus on and then focus here. And, of course, the trouble, the juggling is sometimes you can't. Focus, focus, and that's what was the problem right. until I cranked back the practice to the point where I could write really full time. Now I know you handled. This is in your press release, so I assume it's okay to bring up you handled a landmark jury trial against Toyota, based oh, yeah. on four-wheel drive pickups, alleged propensity to roll over, and actually the verdict you got was the first of its kind in the nation. Can you talk about that? Sure, sure. Um, that. It was a great case. Uh, I mean, not because I was on it. It just had great facts. And and, and uh, the bad part about it was it was in Toyota's hometown. It was uh, the Torrance Superior Courthouse. And at that time, to Toyota's in Texas now, but then they were in Torrance, California. So, you know, the, uh, I mean, it was like I thought I was going to get hometown very badly. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I did. And this, uh, the other thing was, it was the first of its type, the case in the nation. There had been some, uh, I don't know, you have to go back a ways, but the 60 Minutes had done an article on the Jeep CJ6 and CJ7 about how they mm -hmm. tend, if they get sideways, they just roll over because they have mm -hmm. high centers of gravity. And uh, I saw the same thing with the four-wheel drive pickups that were being marketed uh, because they wanted it to look like a CJ7. So how, what did they do? They they raised it up, this high center of gravity. Oh, no. They were rolling. Mm -hmm. And uh, so when the case came along, I think like 10 really good lawyers passed on it. And I said, no, no, this is, I see this as something that'll set a standard. And it did. I mean, yeah. today, in fact, it, it changed the industry. Today, yeah. we don't have many of those types of vehicles. We have... Uh, what we call crossover vehicles. They're lower center of gravity. They still look like sports utility vehicles, but they are safe. If they get sideways, they just skip right, to a stop right. rather than, than roll. So, so yeah, that was a- uh, As usual, despite all the grief lawyers get, you, in, in fact, made the world a better, safer place, right? That's awesome. Right, and and I try to, and that's the, I try to have the book talk to that. Uh, in other words, yeah. through the characters. I mean, I, there's no lecturing in it because nobody likes to hear lectures. Mm -hmm. But through the characters, I speak to that and the fact that uh, you can change the world. And in fact, what happens here is he does stop the world from uh, going way downhill, a non-democracy, mm -hmm. basically. 
That reminds me of something else. And Laura, I apologize. I, I'm going to I'm going to geek out on one more legal question. Then I'll let you talk about writing. No, nope, go for it. <laughs> but I noticed, I, I'm, I'm finding it fascinating. So you go right ahead. I noticed when I they, I got the book a little in advance. I haven't finished it. I apologize, but I love what I've read. And what I really admired was the way you write about because I, I encounter this problem too. When you've got to at least. I don't want to say superficially, but in a thin way, you've got to explain some legal concept so the uh, the plot makes sense, but you're writing to mostly non-lawyers and you want them to understand it without getting boring. That's a tough, and turning it into like a law textbook, that's a tough tightrope to walk, but you do that very well. How, well what's you. your thank approach? You. Yeah. yeah, well, the approach is... First of all, don't lecture. Secondly, <laughs> do it uh, in an entertaining way. In other words, there is, um, we won't get into the details, but there's a thing called a silent conflict, which is a thing about law. And I needed to explain it. And, and I'm assuming most of my readers are non-lawyers. Mm. So I did it conversationally and in a setting that was interesting. They were on a boat. They were having coffee together. And uh, when I thought about that, doing it from a conversation viewpoint, then it all came together. Because even lawyers, when we start talking to one another over coffee, we don't sit there and speak Latin to each mm -hmm. other. You know, we, we <laughs> speak real said. speak. And uh, so that's what I have. I have the characters speaking real. <laughs> you know, I got to say, I had, there was a pre-release review, uh, one, of, one of them, by an editor-in-chief of a magazine. Uh, and she's a trial lawyer herself. Uh, and... She said something that really was great, I thought, because she ca she captured what I was trying to do. She said, Johnson's bad guys are really, in italics, bad. And his good guys are really real. And mm, I said, nice. Sharon, we got it. <laughs> you know, that's what I was trying to do. Uh, so. Very nice. Can you tell us a little bit about your path to publication? Oh, Okay. Uh, it, it's maybe a little different. Are you ready for a little different? Yeah, yes. always. Okay, here we go. Uh, okay, so I had the fragments, then I cranked back my practice, and now I'm writing. Boom, boom, boom. I have my manuscript in February of 2022. The manuscript is final. And while I'm doing that, I'm looking at the publishing industry because the only thing I'd published is nonfiction. I did about 50 technical articles and and one big treatise, but it was all nonfiction. Mm -hmm. But I thought, you know, I know publishers and editors in the nonfiction world. When I'm ready, I'm just going to call them and say, hey, do you have any friends <laughs> in the fiction world? And here's here's where I, I slammed into the wall. Uh, they didn't. The, the nonfiction mm -hmm. people don't talk to the fiction people. The right. fiction people don't even know who the nonfiction people are. Mm -hmm. So I was at square one. And I started looking at querying, which is to a non-writer, that whole process is is craziness. Yeah. <laughs> to, every, yeah. to everyone, it's a very daunting process. I, I, I really couldn't believe it existed, to tell you the truth. But then I realized it did exist. So I threw out a dozen query letters and got nothing back. I mean, I, I didn't even get a rejection. And... I was ghosted. So I, I went, I said, you know what, Ray, you got to go back to school. I went back to uh, what were like writers con, you know, I went to writers conventions. Mm -hmm. I went to webinars through writers digest university and other groups. Uh, and the international thriller writers were really great. They have mm -hmm. nice classes, good classes. So I'm starting to get that. And then James Lee Burke, who I think is the master crime fiction writer alive today James Lee Burke was interviewed, and I was on the webinar uh, listening to the interview, and they said, James, have you ever been rejected? And he goes, yes, 323 times or some number like that. <laughs> and I said to myself, okay, Ray, hold it. <laughs> stop, stop. If, the, if, if James Lee Burke gets 346 or whatever the heck it was, uh, rejections i could do thousands i mean i could just keep going you know, i have no problem uh and then i said you know what you're not going to go that way and i went to competitions and i just took that manuscript and i put it in the few 
international competitions that allow unpublished manuscripts to bounce against published books. Right. And uh, I won't bore you with the details, but uh, of the five that I entered, I was a finalist in each and every one except for the one where I was first place. So, oh. but once I got up to be finalist in three of them, including the Clive Custer Adventure Writers uh, competition, right. uh, everything changed. Uh, I, I had three agent offers, and then I had uh, multiple pu uh, publication offers, too. Uh, so that's my little secret. Uh, if anybody wants to try to take a shortcut, yeah, you no, that's, you know, yeah. throw it out that's there and see what happens. And yeah. that, that's, that's great advice. Here's another approach that people might be interested in trying. Thanks. Thank yeah. you for sharing that. Well, I, I, and I highly recommend it. I mean, I think it's a thing to do because if you think about it, there's hardly any downside. Most of the good competitions are very inexpensive, you know, like $25, $50, $100, probably max, uh, if they're legitimate competitions. Right. That work. That's the important so thing. Is, yeah. yeah. So, you know, and if and if you're not a finalist, so what? You know, I mean, mm -hmm. you try it. Yeah. You don't have Fine. to tell anyone. You don't have to tell anyone right. you're entering. No, you, you don't have to do it. You don't yeah. have to post it on social media. That's right. That's right. <laughs> yeah. So you uh, talked about how you first started writing. You were just getting those fragments and bits and pieces when you were working around here and there. Now that you're writing full time, what does your typical writing day look like? You have a hmm. kind of a set process, or well, it's a little it's a little strange, and maybe you could tell me why this is, but. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I know. I mean, I need some uh, advice. Um, I'm a night person. I've always you do. Been. Uh, night right, night. right. And, you know, the worst part of trying a case was having to be there at 9 a.m. You know, <laughs> that was hard. I could work all the night. The world does the, not like night people. I <laughs> know. Cooperate with wow. Them. So, uh, but then when I, when the COVID thing came along and I cranked back to practice, I said, well, you know, now, Ray, you got to get serious. I mean, <laughs> you know, if you're going to do it. This Your time has come. That's right. right. So I would get up at 4 a.m., 4 oh. a.m., uh, whether I wanted to or not. And I'd write until coffee break at 10. <laughs> and, you know, no, no, I'm not saying I didn't sometimes write chapters at night because mm -hmm. I am a night person. But most of the heavy writing was done in that time frame when even my dog, was sleeping. I mean, you know, and it was right. just total silence and that was great for me. Uh, you know, that's, okay. that's what works for me. Interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you, do you plan, do you plan out, do you outline? Are you a pantser or a planner? I, I am a, you're never going to see more of a pantser than me. I am, uh, I, I start a scene. I don't even know how the scene's going to end. I okay. let the characters drive me. It's the characters that are going to tell me what to do. And uh, and certainly I never know how a chapter is going to end. And I didn't know how the book was going to end. And by the way, Bill, when you do get to the ending, I'd, I'd love to get your opinion on it. Uh, <laughs> you, I really would. But uh, I will tell you that ending came at the end. I did, I did not know how it was going to end. Really? So, uh, we, yeah. We've heard this before. And I'm, I yeah. never cease to be fascinated by how many approaches – there are to this wonderful craft that we yeah. pursue. There's no uh, yeah. one way. Most people are hybrid, don't you? And most of the writers I've talked to yeah. seem to be a hybrid. They do some outlining and some some organic writing, if you want to call right. it that. But pantser, pantsering. Uh, you know, the, the my favorite author besides James Lee Burke because he's just he's up in the stratosphere. But uh, of the of the normal people of the world, it's Michael Conley, who I think is a great writer, mm -hmm. and uh, and he's a pantser too. Now, I didn't know that until after I had written Conspiracy Ignited. But uh, mm -hmm. you know, and and that's probably why I was drawn to his uh, his work. I've read every book yeah. he's ever written. Fascinating. Yeah. So I think you hinted, or maybe you. Maybe I guessed, but at any rate, I think you're working on something else now. What what can we look forward to seeing from you in the future? An Eric Ridge thriller. Eric Ridge being the lawyer that's in the middle of all this. Eric Ridge two. Eric Ridge two. It's gonna be. <laughs> it's gonna at least be three series. That's okay. my plan. But uh, you Is know, this a I, conspiracy ablaze because it was ignited in the first one. So how did you know that? I'm just a, how did you know you're that? You're joking, that, right? No, it's the working title. That's the working uh, title. Oh, yeah. wow. 
Yeah. Well, that's impressive. Yeah. And, and then the third is this was the Raven Society, because it's about mm -hmm. the Raven Society. But, you know, when you get together with your publisher and your editor and all these other people of the world, you compromise. And I, I thought it was a great compromise, by the way. But mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. That, I, mm -hmm. Bill, that's amazing. Well, and <laughs> then, <laughs> then third is Conspiracy Inferno. I don't know. We don't know. Well, that's very interesting. <laughs> I hadn't, uh, I've got a neighbor who's kind of a wise guy, and he says, Well, why don't you just go with Conspiracy Extinguished? I said, Stop. <laughs> no, no, no. Can't put it Stop. out. <laughs> <laughs> that's so mess, I right? don't know. I, yeah, yeah. But anyway, it is the working title, though. Great, great. great. Yeah. Well, Ray, thanks so much for being on the podcast. This has been a real pleasure. Well, thank you. And thank you for asking me. And uh, I hope to see you soon. I'm going to, I do plan on coming out to a writer's con. So uh, that would be yeah. fantastic. Love We'd you. love to have yeah. you. Just a few parting words. Laura, we are getting very close to the WriterCon retreat. I started packing. I, oh, oh, well, that means it's really going to happen, I guess. <laughs> what are you looking forward to at the retreat? We have not just some familiar faces coming back, but we have some new people joining us. It's filling up pretty quickly, but I'm so excited to meet our newcomers and mm -hmm. start reading their pages and establish those connections and see... See who's going to be our next um, best-selling author that comes out of one of our retreats. This is really the way to get the most work done on your mm -hmm. uh, manuscript, in my opinion. We right. really roll up our sleeves and get busy during these retreats, and you learn a lot, and then you get so much feedback mm -hmm. on your manuscript. I just don't think there's anything better. And then, of course, we're going to be having... Um, meals and snacks together. I'm looking forward to hiking, hot tubbing, uh, all the things that are available to us at the spa. So we're going to, we're going to work hard and play hard and I'm ready to get away and unplug. Good. This is going to sound a little braggy, but I've had people tell me they felt like they were riding at a higher and better level after five days of the retreat mm -hmm. and reading their work, I agreed. Yes. <laughs> so yes. I think it's well, and we should mention it's not just you and me, Laura, Lauren Smith, who's mm -hmm. a USA Today best selling author, is coming out one day, and Amy Brewer, one of the best agents in the world, is coming out. And I think there's going to be somebody else, but it's not quite confirmed, so I won't say that yet. But <laughs> we're going to have a great faculty. So if if you'd like to spend five days in a beautiful location writing and improving your or starting your work in progress, we don't care where you are in the process, come to the Writer Con Retreat. And since this is the first podcast we've recorded since my new book came out, I got to mention that I got a new book out. It's called Justice for All. It's Daniel Pike Legal Thriller number eight. But this one's a team. Oh, did I say team up? No, it's like a cage match against <laughs> NC Rivera from the Splitsville series. So I'm doing another crossover book, but this time they're on opposite ends of the courtroom. And let me tell you, sparks fly. That's justice for all by me. All right, then, everyone. You heard what Ray Johnson said, tough doesn't quit, which is pretty much a variation of what I say every week, isn't it? All right? Keep writing. And remember, you cannot fail if you refuse to quit. See you next time.